I suppose we've been talking about the balance between the uh, input and control of parents, of government and of teachers, of those three groups. And um, I was reflecting on it. I suddenly thought of the moment almost exactly 35 years ago. I know it was then with my son, who is in Rose, turned 40 at Christmas, and he was in his first year at school. My youngest child left full-time education last year, so I had 35 years of um, being a parent with people in full-time, kids in full-time education. Anyway, my other son came back with a, uh, a note that said, almost in exactly these words, Dear parent, uh, as it is a leap year this year, Monday will be a holiday. And I said, what the bloody hell do they mean? Monday will be a holiday. This was about the Thursday of the previous week. And it was a wonderful example of producer capture in, in uh, practice. Somebody had added up the number of days that they were working in the ILEA in that time and decided that because it was a leap year and they were going to have to work one more day than uh, <laughs> they were contracted to work. And while you might have thought they should have taken off five, five sixths of the day or something like that, they took the day off. And it was just announced. And it was my first indication that the balance had gone somehow wrong. And in fact, the balance had got very badly wrong at that time. And uh, government came in and, and took over from the early 1990s. And up to that time, <coughs> as many people are as long and two as me will remember, the central government department of education was the smallest of the central, the big spending departments in central government. Central government didn't do anything in education. They issued circulars and uh, local authorities did everything. Anyway, that, that uh, imbalance that I observed 35 years ago uh, when my younger two children were at school. I had another example of, of that when I decided, I can't remember why exactly, I wanted to examine the quality of, of uh, their school reports, uh, not of, from the point of view of whether they were doing anything worthwhile and working hard, but the quality of the reports. And I started with year three for some reason. And it didn't, I didn't go much further beyond reason, year three, because in year three, my two, my third and fourth children were extraordinarily different. My third child was an extremely, extremely intelligent young man who now works with the New Yorker magazine. And uh, his sister was somewhat more challenged in, in the academic field. And I read their reports, and they were identical, word for word identical. Long, but, but an A4 of what they were doing in maths and how they were doing and so on, identical word for word. And I thought, so what is it about the relationship between the consumer, me, and the producer, that she is so completely contemptuous of, of uh, the task that she's doing, that she does it in this way. And what disturbed me, really disturbed me, was that she was the best teacher in the school by some way. So something had gone wrong there. My three participants in there. Well, today we've had uh, reflections on that relationship, and it's, they started with um, Gabriel, who uh, is nothing not self confident, and so when he tells you something, you Better believe it. He, he told us pretty much that there isn't a sil silver bullet, and ch school choice is certainly not a silver bullet. And that, that theme has run throughout the day that nobody's suggesting that school choice is uh, a silver bullet. But I think uh, the other uh, conclusions that I heard that were broadly speaking. Um, agreed were that parents these are agreed until um, Julian uh, 
spoken in favor of school, well, in favor of parental choice by speaking very firmly against it. <laughs> uh, but up to then, <clears throat> most people had been reasonably supportive of parental choice. And I think I had concluded that the, the constraints and the really very major constraints that exist in terms of uh, the possibility of, of reasonable markets being developed uh, are geographical constraints, those sort of constraints. And I'm the first school I went to, first secondary school I went to, there wasn't another school within 60 miles. It was in the West Highlands, and um, there wasn't a lot of possibility of competition there. But I don't think it was to do with parental choice was the parents there, and I think parents in most cases are really remarkably intelligent about uh, what they want for their children. And you see that in the independent sector, uh, where the balance between the teachers who are very much in charge of, of developing the offer and the uh, response of the parents, which would not be a clear uh, exposition of what they wanted in curriculum terms and what they wanted in, in, uh, in terms of precise product. But they've got a very clear idea. And the teachers are well aware that those parents have a clear idea broadly of what they want for their children. And I don't think, incidentally, it's uh, just um, <clears throat> uh, exam results unless <coughs> The system drives them to that point. I think most parents want something much broader than that, and indeed many parents who, I suspect, um, Graham might be one of them, who have selected um, uh, an independent school for one of their children, very often it's not for anything to do with the curriculum. I couldn't get into that So uh, I don't think that's the, the constraint, but. Um, and I think parents do generally make pretty good choices. I think parents, in some respects, should have more choices. One of, one of the, the things I've reflected on over the, the last 10 years is whether we know that there is one set of outcomes and that that, that set of outcomes is the only set of outcomes that is desirable. For example, I don't have any uh, particular knowledge of or enthusiasm for Steiner schools, but I know people who are very keen on Steiner schools, and uh, I, I've said to them on a number of occasions, you should do some research on your Steiner schools. You should find 50 people who are 50 years old and went to Steiner schools and see how they've done in life. And if you could demonstrate that they've done perfectly well, then you would have something to say about the outcomes of Steiner schools. Because Steiner, when we first started debates about uh, state-supported private schools, which was about 15 years ago, Tim, I suppose, uh, 20 years ago, perhaps, uh, and I remember Steiner saying, we're desperate to be inclusive. And I thought, well, that's a legitimate aspiration. They want to have a Steiner school in every urban area, which can provide places on um, a subsidized basis uh, because a lot of people have to pay. And we could have a much broader range of options available to people. And again, that's, this would be parents making decisions which were in no way driven by the utilitarian philosophy of, of most of the school system today. So <clears throat> we, we haven't gone as far today as we might have done in the options available. But I think the other thing that uh, I enjoyed the debate. Uh, I enjoyed the debate because um, Laura was a McInerney, uh was very convincing. And then unfortunately had Andrew uh, Harrop after who convinced me almost as uh, fully that I couldn't possibly vote for his side. But I enjoyed that. 
uh, cut and thrust and, and swinging to and fro. And uh, I think the consensus that came out particularly was that most people are in favour of school autonomy and the only thing was that there wasn't quite a full enough definition of school autonomy. It seems to me perfectly clear that school autonomy must mean a measure of independence greater than some people envisage. And one person who got a very good press today, and doesn't get a very good press very often these days, is Tony Blair. Well, I'm not going to give Tony Blair a good press uh, to finish off the day, otherwise his agents might go and tell him that CMRE was his sort of uh, think tank. Tony Blair was the man who, shortly after setting up the academies, said, these independent state schools, he said, and I immediately got alarmed and said, you can be an independent school, you can be a state school, you can't be both. And I think it's fundamental that they should uh, be developing real independence. And real independent, by real independence, I mean that if, if government changes and uh, Corbyn-led administration comes to power, can they nationalise the academies easily? And if they can, then they're probably not independent schools. And that comes down to one of the <coughs> very important things which was pretty much concluded uh, by a couple of speakers today, and very interestingly. I used to use the, a lot in, in CFPT the Jesuit phrase, no margin, no mission. And uh, it's worth thinking about no margin, no mission. Because if you, haven't, you can't make a margin, you've got no autonomy, you're working somebody else's agenda, you've got no reserves for difficult times, you've got no reserves to do anything innovative yourself. And that's why the conclusion that for-profit schools is interesting, not in terms of driving the, the mainstream of education, but in terms of the people who might innovate, the people who might, as uh, somebody <coughs> suggested, be best placed to help uh, do something genuinely different for uh, those in most need. It's no margin, no mission is, is the, the uh, uh, most important aphorism for schools. Independence, the independent sector in Britain is very successful because it's independent. So I've had an enjoyable day and I feel in need of a drink now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I commend you all to <coughs> the bar and to have a drink, but first, let me just say finally, thanks particularly to our sponsors, because there's been a number of them, I can't remember but especially amongst our sponsors to IEA, who hosted this meeting, and it's um, been very worthwhile. And final thanks to James Croft, because actually none of this would happen if it weren't for his uh, endless energy in, in uh, promoting the agenda that we're all finding so interesting. And it's much more mainstream now than it was even five years ago. And I think that's a good thing. So James, well done. You may also have a drink. <laughs> Thank you very much.